and we can begin whenever you're ready. Hello, everybody. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Joseph Yuhas for our final plenary session today. Dr. Yuhas it holds a PhD in uh, psychology from the University of California, Berkeley, and has worked for the last 40 or so years in architecture, developing the discipline of environmental psychology. And he is, to be honest, the reason that I'm sitting here today. So if you will please join me in welcoming uh, Joe to today's plenary session. And Joe, the floor is yours. Well, I'll try to get off the floor, but you know, it's not easy when you're 83 years old. The knees start wearing out the, and so on and so forth. Well, in any case, I am on a chair, so that's not bad. The title of my talk today is Democritus again and again, but not twice. So for those of you who didn't have a classical education, the word Democritus uh, refers in my mind most significantly to what this fellow said about, I would guess maybe about 15, 1600 years ago, which is you cannot put your foot in the same river twice. This is meant to be a very clever statement, which in fact it is, and to sound false, so you have to dig through what it means where the truth is. And the truth is very simple, but in a sense, our way of thinking now as 1,600 years ago, doesn't find it easy to make the connection. Namely, the river is in constant dynamic change. No, no two things in this universe are equal ever. And that includes what happens in the passage of time, however brief the time is. Now, of course, Democritus in Tended that statement to last long than one quadrillionth of a second when he uttered it. In fact, he wrote it down. So in part, he's imparting a paradox. What he's saying doesn't mean today what it meant when he said it. For that matter, as soon as he said it, it no longer meant what he said. But then again, it we've lost audio. Joe, we've lost your audio. Scott, are you saying? Uh, yeah, we lost your audio Scott, for a Scott. moment. Well, why don't I see? He says here that I'm sending a strong signal, but let me switch to another internet signal anyway. This is the danger of internet. Yeah. Okay. You're back. Uh, can you, supposedly I am now connected to uh, something with a strong signal. So yes. was the last one supposedly. Can you hear me okay now? Yes, better actually. Thank you. So, what was the last thing you all heard? You were talking about the, the, um, the, the statement now means something different than it meant when Democritus wrote it down. But then, of 
course, it doesn't it? So it's a paradox. On the one hand, it's perfectly true that nothing is the same even after a quintillionth of second has passed. All the same, that statement is still meaningful today, although quite literally probably doesn't mean exactly what it meant when he said it. Language changes, context changes, our idea of a river changes, etc., and so forth. So this paradox is in mind absolutely primary when I think about the quote unquote social sciences, and we'll get to that in a minute. And I think we can perhaps begin by building a tunnel from 2021 to around 400 A A A AD, or was it even a lot earlier? Certainly no later than that. That Democritus said and wrote this, and say the following: What is it that Einstein and or late 20th and 21st century physics has to say that Democritus didn't already say uh, 1,400 years ago? The answer is nothing. They're just repeating what Democritus already said. And they don't have experimental evidence. You can't. In fact, by definition of 20th and 21st century science, which has left empirical science and become speculative, they essentially philosophers repeating what an ancient Greek philosopher said 1,400 years ago. So in that sense, Democritus writes again with people who either are or pretend to be ignorant that they're just repeating something that was said 1,400 years ago. On the other hand, when 21st century science says it, it's something very radically different from what it meant when Democritus said it. And how is it different? Maybe the simplest way to express the difference would be the following. The Greeks under Democritus did not have hydrogen bombs, did not have atomic bombs, did not have other special weapons, did not have biological warfare, et cetera, et cetera, and so forth. And 21st century physics, all that it is, no, nothing more glorious than a ignorant or willfully ignorant or just plain ignorant repetition of a Greek philosopher. unlocked because it was 20th century physics, 21st century physics with Edward Teller and other Hungarian Jews that unlocked this incredible thing which is maybe continuous with man stealing fire from the gods. But when you're dealing with an H-bomb, we have brought the sun itself down to earth and have power that is absolutely unmeasurable or was utterly unthinkable except as white or black magic in Democritus's time. We have become wizards in the meantime. Yes, we were wizards then already as soon as we could make a fire in the middle of the night, that was wizardry. But here, you know, we enter the other door to this paradox, which is a door for my 
mind most obviously marked with the name Karl Marx, marked with Marx, the marks on the door say Marx. He wasn't a Hungarian Jew, he was an English Jew. Well, there's always the, the, the other Jew. Well, he was a German Jew living in England. Anyway, uh, which is that sometimes a, sometime a change in quantity is so radical as to be a change in quality. So when we say you can't put your foot in the same river twice, there's two categories of change that occur. One is slow incremental change, and the other is radical and dramatic change. And often when you're in the river itself and swimming, it's hard to tell whether you are part of a change that's incremental or part of a change that is absolutely radical and revolutionary. So it is that we have the development of what is called science, the development of what is called social science. I'm using the word development very, very intentionally. The market is to the term for something where today we have propaganda and thought control that is absolutely continuous with the Egyptian pharaohs or, or, or Moses or whomever, yet the degree to which that is working and the degree to which we demonize somebody with a different point of view from ours and or won't listen to them has increased so dramatically that really modern technologies are like the hydrogen bomb or something that is continuous with the beginnings of preaching or the beginnings of being a, a prophet, but at the same time, so radically more powerful as the bomb. Here, I think I would like to add one thought to all of this. Yesterday, what was on my bedtime? Ten minutes of ten downtime here in the United States. I decided to reread the first chapter. How is uh, the sound now, Scott? You're 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 detuning uh, frequently. Your your signal is degrading. Huh. Well, how uh, can you hear me now? It's claiming it's a strong signal. It, 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 you're fine, but then you start to I just turn into a robot it. for a bit at points. Well, here's, here is what we know, then, right? The National Security Agency is listening. <laughs> um, maybe, maybe some of the things uh, that I say they like, and some of the things I, they, I say they don't like. Or is it the Russian Secret Service? Is it the Chinese Secret Service? Or is it Her Majesty's Secret Servant with James Bond as her servant? I don't know. Maybe if you try without the camera on, even though we like looking at you, maybe if you reduce some bandwidth, we might hear you better. 
I stopped video, uh, then it came back. Now I stopped video again. Yeah, you come uh, in clearer. Keep me posted if I can. Say again? You're clearer now. Good. So uh, obviously the National Security Agency does not like my face. And maybe it was really more offended by what I look like than what I'm saying. This is no small matter because human communication is not merely verbal, take my word for it. And it's particularly inadequate when the signals that are neither verbal nor visual are lacking. That is to say things like smell and so forth, which the 21st century to the contrary notwithstanding, we'll still have the situation where Joe Biden will travel to Europe to meet with Putin or uh, Angela Merkel will travel to Washington to meet in person with Joe Biden, COVID-19 to the contrary notwithstanding, because these are very, very skilled politicians and they know there is more than human communication than Zoom or audio, visual, or movies. So here again, we have very intriguing continuities and discontinuities. And when I uh, lost my face here, what can I do? Face is very, very important to me. I come from a hybrid Asian and um, uh, European culture being Hungarian and face and face saving is not a small matter in my culture, I'll tell you that. So even before my loss of face, I was saying that for the first time in an enormously long time, I started looking at what Protestant call, Protestants call the Book of Revelation and what Roman Catholics call the Apocalypse, which is the last book of the Christian Bible. And I was looking at it um, in the King James translation, which is not a very good translation, but is the basis of all literature since uh, it was published many hundreds of years ago including grace from Ecclesiastes, there is nothing new under the sun, which is an interesting repetition in an interesting way of the thoughts of the Mercritus. And I reading the first chapter of Apocalypse, and I say, well, I know I have read this many, many times, but it is so new to me. I have this experience over and over and over again. It's the same river and my foot is in it at the same time. I read Melville's Moby Dick. I get an incredible lot out of it. A year later, I reopen it and I say, are you sure this is the same book? I have changed. And in a real sense, the book itself has changed. Although the ink in paper is just degrading very slowly and turning from white to yellow. For all that, it's just new to me. But then again, there is a wisdom in it that doesn't change. Whereas, and it is not science, Melville's Moby Dick is no more science than John's Apocalypse, nor is it any more science than Democritus, nor is it any more science than the writings of Confucius, nor is it any more scientific than 
the Bhagavad Gita, or for that matter, the Odyssey. The Odyssey is a gold mine of wisdom to anyone. Change as it does by the minute, hour, and day, it remains a gold mine. What 21st century science has to say in 50 years will be a matter of interest to historians of science only, because science changes by the minute, hour, and day, and pretty much nothing in it endures. We have scientific revolutions, and we have them regularly, as for example, with the Heisenbergian principle, which merely restates what Democritus had to say. Yet at the same time, while it is just completely lacking in wisdom, it has power that is undreamt of when the Odyssey is first said or when it is written down. That is the 21st century apocalypse, isn't it? We have unlocked power without knowledge that is powerful enough to destroy all life on this planet I I'm convinced that that statement that I just made is true. I'm completely convinced that the statement I just made is true. So the year is 1963. And I am 25 years of age. And I am officer of the deck on the USS Forrestal, the first jet carrier. And we are cruising in the Mediterranean Sea. And it is the Cuban Missile Crisis. The word no is very, should be used very, very carefully. And I will use it at some peril to myself. I knew then, and I know now, that the planes we were launching had enough special weapons on them just from our one ship to destroy all life on this planet. unmeasurable power, unmeasurable lack of knowledge. That's 1963, 73, 83, 93, 2003, 2013 is only two years away. The development of special weapons did not start in 1963, nor did it stop. Where is the discontinuity? I would pin it on World War I, and then it accelerates. But it's a change in World War I, is a change in quantity that is so great as to be a change in quality. That's poison gas, if nothing else. And that is, I will be a total conspiracy theorist beyond all reason. The post-World War I influenza epidemic. And I'm not convinced that biological warfare had not 
already started by 1914. We don't know who released what. Or was it just simply a consequence of nature getting even with us to even the score of what we have done, what we had done to it with poison gas? That's an open question. But I would not put it at zero, all that it sounds terribly conspiratorial, that experiments with biological warfare hadn't already started. Or perhaps we can simply put it this way. Louis Pasteur, et cetera, et cetera. When they begin the war on germs, in one sense or another, begin biological warfare. Let's us simply ask her this question and be a bit more mildly conspiratorial than we were before. In a war between human beings and germs, who is going to win the battles and who has already won the bar, war? I can't say that I know this, but I can say that I'm certain of it. As soon as we began that war, we started winning battles, but we had already lost the war. And that's the 20th and the 21st century apocalypse. And it's accelerating and accelerating. And now we've been in the midst of a first cousin of the uh, influenza epidemic that killed both of my grandfathers. That has now lasted a year and a half and is from what I can see from here in some places in the world, including some places in the United States, galloping again. We have not really even won the mini war against COVID-19, although we clearly won three major battles, vaccine one, vaccine two, vaccine three. How many of you think that's a war that's completely over? I don't think so. And that this mutant will be followed by another more powerful mutant seems to me handwriting in the wall, on the wall. We're definitely already in the midst of something that can historically be described as an apocalypse. An unveiling, an unveiling of a kind of end time. Going back now again, doing my triple somersault Democritus trait, What has changed and what remains the same? Is there on this planet to our ability to tell a competitor with humans that's a living organism of which we are aware? I don't think so. I don't think there are mutant monkeys somewhere that are working on an other version of the hydrogen bomb or of Zoom or communicating in language that we do. Wherever or whenever the human race may have first appeared, we humans, we are in my mind, utterly and completely continuous with all other life forms on this planet, whether it is trees or whether it is raccoons, monkeys, or wolves, 
or bats or bacteria or viruses. Yet at the same time, we're utterly discontinuous to them. And what has shown up in the meantime that is discontinuous with us? I don't see. I don't hear it. I don't touch it. But in some way, I feel it. We may have written the chapter where we are somehow being replaced or replaced by something we cannot see. Sometimes I'm quote unquote aware of that in my dreams. I spend, I think as the average human does, roughly from beginning to now on the average, one third of my life asleep and dreaming. Of my dreams, I recall very little when I'm awake, but I recall some of them, though I can't possibly recall what it was. Memory being what it is, and the river of memory being what it is, and memory being under constant change as it is. And in the dreams, there is some kind of a feeling that is captured perhaps in Aldous Huxley's uh, A Brave New World or Shakespeare, any of his plays or any of his sonnets or for that matter in the uh, book of Revelation by John, also called the book of the apocalypse, or that is perhaps retold in much of science fiction that has been written since the mid 1950s when Huxley wrote Brave New World where we are perhaps moving in a direction of beings that are hybrid made and hybrid born, that are biological and yet again not biological. Assuming that there is a world left that they can inhabit, or assuming that perhaps we <laughs> colonize Mars <laughs> and we have those beings up there. Because we have made this planet inhabitable even to manufactured goods. But who is to say that between them, Google, Amazon, Mercedes-Benz, Samsung, Toyota, are not capable of being hybrids that can live on a planet that's very, very hot and has very little oxygen. I am not the one who can say that that is so. And maybe somehow that is the next step. 
I am not going to take a deep breath and pretend to change the subject, although I am extremely My computer is again complaining about the signal. We lost you for a minute. We heard take a deep breath and that was the last we heard. I should be back on, uh, am I? Yes, you are. Okay. Clearly something I said was not to Her Majesty's liking. But I will now switch from Her Majesty to somebody else. She is merely the head of the Anglican Church and queen by the grace of God. There is somebody on this planet much more powerful than she is, and that is the emperor of Japan. The emperor of Japan is not ruling by the grace of God. He is a God. He's not ruling by the grace of God. He's a God. Is the rising sun. And to this day, including the present day emperor of Japan, once a year, he has physical sexual intercourse with the moon. In him, the sun and the moon connect sexually. With all respect to the Queen of England, the Queen of the Netherlands, the King of Belgium and Holland and Denmark and Spain, maybe you're not mating with the sun and the moon. You are not a god. I wonder if any of you who look like grown-ups have heard of the 21st century psychiatric phrase, video game addiction. This is a game made up by psychiatrists to make something like severe schizophrenia or severe loss of personality or absolutely dramatically severe multiple uh, uh, personality, in case an insanity, appear to be a mere addiction. I wonder if any of you have had the experience of seeing people on a modern uh, uh, machine uh, which is an arcade machine. I have. If you want to be seriously disturbed, watch people who are acting like automata, sweating, dancing, jerking, and at the same time, watching demons who are in effect possessed by demons. Where is this demonic possession coming from? Coming 90% from Japan, 
10% from South Korea and no place else that I know of. It ain't coming from Berndale. It ain't coming from Disney. It ain't coming from Broadway. It ain't coming from Budapest. It ain't coming from London, Paris, or Beijing, or uh, Rio de Janeiro, or Mexico City. It's not even coming from Tel Aviv or Jer Jerusalem, the incredible power of the tiny country in electronics notwithstanding. It's Japanese doing to forward what they did with Toyota, or the South Koreans doing to forward what they did with Samsung or Honda. So, with the permission of my hosts, I'm going to switch on the camera again and see if you folks can understand my costume. Scott, can you understand my costume? I, what does your shirt say? Or your vest what say? Language, what, in what language does it say? I, I, can't, I can't actually read it. It's Blurry. No, you can't, but you should be able to know what language oh, it is. I couldn't see it clearly. It's it's either Japanese or Korean, but it's still kind of fuzzy. There's only one possible answer, namely it is Japanese. Wrong. Oh. I'm sorry, it is too blurry for me to see. Korean. I can, I, oh, it's Korean. Okay. Korean. It's not Japanese. I am dressed in a co in Korean costume that is not bicultural. It's purely Korean. And the uh, vest that I have on is one that is worn by workers who work for the Seoul Electric Company. Repair men, not repair people. Not repair humans, but repair men. Some people think that my costume is just random because I'm actually a psychologist and I don't understand anything about environmental design. I beg to differ with them. Usually there is very little about my costume that is not, in some sense of the word, intentional. So there is J-pop and there is K-pop. Both of them take essentially Euro-American round eye discoveries and running with it to an increase in quality that is an increase in kind. A Toyota is not merely a better Ford. A Hyundai is not merely a better Chevy, and you know it. The Japanese and the Koreans have taken the science of propaganda developed in America, Britain, Germany, Austria, Hungary, the Soviet Union, and run with it. And they have as their slaves a generation of people roughly between the ages of 13 and 30 who have what psychiatrists in the West call video game addiction. These people can't sleep. They're possessed by demons and they have been turned into machines 
under the command of the emperor of Japan, who is a god. And the people in the former Japanese colony, Korea, and the North Koreans don't do video games, but they sure form a duality with South Korea, which has to do with the sacred mountain and with the gods and the shamanic creatures that inhabit the arcade games and to a lesser extent the video games. The video game is not exactly what the real arcade game is. The real arcade game I observed when last had the stomach to go there in Littleton, haha, a suburb of Denver, Colorado. Littleton, the little, little town, has the most developed arcade in Colorado. I saw a man in his early 30s who was so severely undernourished that he could pass for a survivor of a German death camp from World War II, who was sweating so hard that sweat was dripping from his body, and who was quote unquote dancing uncontrollably as the slave of shamanic demons from the ancient religions of Japan and who was paying to be a slave. He wasn't being paid. He was a slave. He was paying to be enslaved as we're enslaved to cars, as we are enslaved to the computer, as we are enslaved to the quote unquote smart telephone, ha ha. But to a degree, I mean, I am paying Comcast to be its slave. But to the best of my knowledge, I'm not sweating, nor am I jerking around uncomfortably. Though maybe I am, and I fool myself to thinking that I am not. So where does that leave what we call the social sciences? Interest. What I say is a repetition now for the many, many a time what I said when I started. When did I start? Ha ha. Ask Einstein whether I started 50 minutes ago or whether I started in the future or in the past. In Einsteinian time, there is no answer to that question. We're back to Democritus. And where I started was the wisdom is in the great quote unquote literary works. The demonic power is in our science. The wisdom is not powerful like the sciences. 
the wisdom has a relationship to time which is pretty dramatically and drastically different. What Democritus said will be a mine of wisdom a long time from now, by which time, haha, 20th and 21st century science will be of interest to historians only. I think I am three minutes before 10 o'clock on my clock here, but time is relative. What does your clock say? Yeah, the same, except the it's same five well. o'clock. What does it say? It's 4.58, my time. Ah, uh, uh, my time is yours, but then again, it's not but my time has come. Is there discussion or am I out of time or what's happening? Uh, yes, we do have one question. Yes. Uh -huh. Let me go to it. Uh -huh. Go to it. Yes. Fantastic talk, Joseph. That was very interesting. I was hanging off your every word. Very, very good. Um, someone says, it could be argued that pandemics and apocalypse affect the marginalized populations of any nation state more than how these affect the privileged classes. Could we expect more of such pandemics and increasing differences between social classes in the future? Well, I think that what this person is saying is both true and false, it's paradoxical. I think that the ultra rich and the ultra privileged are more scared than anybody else because they're slaves to their possessions and they lock themselves in to a locked house which is in a locked neighborhood, which is in a locked town etc etc and they're in a constant state of fear that is more basic more fundamental than that of a homeless person they may die of the epidemic with a lesser frequency than others and again their children may not At the same time, they have Persian rugs, they have Tesla, $250 electrically driven Tesla with a battery that will poison this planet for the next five to 10,000 years and is quote, environmental. And they go to Whole Foods where they buy for their dogs guaranteed gluten-free, 100% raised in the wild uh, uh, goat meat sandwiches, and then are terribly worried that perhaps a fly has landed on that piece of goat meat and they better throw it out, but it better be recycled because protecting Mother Earth requires us to sell it to send it to the recycling factory in a truck that if you can afford it actually has an electric drive, uh, which has batteries in it that will poison this planet for a hundred thousand years. But it's very environmental. Wonderful. So at this time, does anybody else have any questions? Well, you can, oh, yes. I, I just want to, Joe, it, Where are you? If it's wait not... a second. Who is it that's asking the question? Oh, I'm, it, Joe, I just was going to ask you to elaborate if you don't, if, if you're, if you don't mind telling your story about slaves to possessions. 
about what i'm sorry oh, about yeah, being sure, enslaved sure. to your possessions yeah absolutely yeah uh, okay i know i i try to do it re reasonably abbreviated version i am now it's 1944 six years old my father was in a work camp my mother took a bunch of money and bribed my father out of the work camp and he's on his way to hide in a convent because he is jewish we are in hungary it's 1944 and it's the holocaust and for one night he comes home and strangely enough we have dinner guests and on the day uh billboards and uh uh, uh, announcements have gone up all over town. All Jews must, must report to the uh, trotting stadium uh, for a census. And this couple say to us, I am sitting on the floor at my father's seat. Well, we're going to go. And my eyes roll into my head my father's eyes roll into his head and my father speaks don't you realize this is a trap and the couple answers we have always trusted the authorities pause besides we can't live without our persian carpets what happened to these people they went into a trap and they were killed. They didn't go to a work camp, they went to a death camp. They were sent to a death camp. To the best of your ability, my advice to you is minimize the degree to which you allow yourself to be enslaved by your possessions. Whatever advice I have an old man, that's my advice as an old man. Is this story the, the one you wanted to hear? Yes, yes, Joe. I, I, I just thought that that was a very important point to the, to, to the previous question. Well, and I can add to it the following. The worst thing you can do, in my opinion, as a very old man, is to give up hope. If they, quote unquote, they want anything, it's for you to say the situation is hopeless. No, it's not. I am alive. My father lived through the Holocaust. Thank you. Right, we do have one question from Angeliki. Would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Hello, everyone. Hello. And hello, Joseph, and thank you very much for this talk. And I must say, I enjoyed very much your sense of humor. Thank you so much for this. Um, I do have- Hungarian. Are you Turkish by any chance? No, I'm Greek. Oh, well, that's, uh, need I say more? <laughs> uh, I'd, like, I'd like your thoughts on, on one aspect of your talk, Joseph, please. You did mention that um, humanity has created technology without knowledge. And um, I often think about uh, what a, a very dear professor of mine said recently to me that, um, university is about producing new knowledge and the pursuit of knowledge and i'm wondering since education seems to be torn by different agendas and um contrasting agendas of, of different stakeholders in in formal education what are your thoughts about the future pursuit of knowledge whether it is in the formal setting of university or outside of it well the thought I have with regard to what you say 
is the following. Much of what is called quote unquote knowledge will be of interest to historians of quote unquote knowledge 20 years from now, it will have been superseded. What is the wisdom in the Odyssey is not about to go away 20 years from now, nor for that matter books one and two of Genesis, or for that matter the writings of Confucius. Now, does that mean that doing classified research for the American the Israeli, the Russian, the Chinese, or the British government is useless? No, it's not useless. There's gonna be super hydrogen bombs. There's gonna, there are, are you know, I, I am disclosing not, nothing confidential. You will have heard that talking about 1963, I didn't simply say hydrogen bombs and atomic bombs. I said special weapons. The development of special weapons continues and it's the research labs in Boulder and Cambridge and Oxford and Tokyo and Seoul and Pyongyang and other places where uh, uh, Tel Aviv and other places uh, are producing them. They're not producing knowledge, they're producing power. Is power unimportant? No, it's not. <laughs> not if you have faced a German major in full army uniform staring down at you and saying, who are you? No, that's not meaningless. He holds the power of life and death over you. Am I even close to your question, my angel, Andre Kaki? I think I think you are, and thank you for this. I just uh, I'm um, I'm always considering about education and what it has to offer um, for future generations, and I think this shift that you're talking about the concentration on on power rather than knowledge. Sometimes I find it a bit unnerving, Joseph. I'll be honest. This is where I'm at at the age of 83 and one half. So, where are we? All right, so at this time, does anybody else have any questions for Joseph? You can either raise your hand in Zoom or you can write your question in the chat box for us to read. Um, Elizabeth is going to be posting the discussion board for this conversation so that we can continue the talk on the internet. Yes, it was a very good session. And if nobody has any questions, we can begin wrapping up. Thank you so much, Joseph. That was a fantastic talk. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm very, very appreciative of it. And uh, I thank the uh, National Security Agency for not completely uh, censoring what I have to say. The only censoring it occasionally, so. Of course. You are a fascinating individual, Joseph. I will not be forgetting this for a very long time. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, everybody. We do have a couple announcements. The closing talking circle for this afternoon has been canceled, but, but here in about less than an hour, we do have a live workshop session from one of our delegates at this conference. If anybody is willing, if anyone is wanting to join, it is called Healthcare, 
just got graphic. And you can find that under the presentation tab and under the featured subcategory. And thank you so much, everybody. This concludes our plenary for today with Joseph. If anybody has any more questions, I will remain in this meeting for a couple minutes. And please enjoy the rest of your conference experience. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And Elizabeth, I, I did get your, your email. I'm going to have to give that to Christina as the head of school. Um, and she just left on leave today. So it'll be just a little bit before That's we get okay. back That's around. We just wanted to make sure to get it to you. That way we like it doesn't slip. <laughs> so, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Julia, thank you so much for, for bringing Jessica on board for us to, for this. That's us all. <laughs> and I hope you enjoyed, Joe. You might understand my weirdness a little bit more after working <laughs> with, I, I worked with him for 10 years. So... <laughs> Maybe I make a little more sense now. I don't know. It was amazing. It was an amazing talk. <laughs> Very good. Yes. I'm He's sad that Elizabeth missed Jessica's session this morning. That was also super good. I'm going to watch the recording. I definitely want to watch the recording for that one. <laughs> oh,